smoking, drinking is considered as sophistication. And being a 18 year old or a 19 year old, you really want to be accepted amongst your peer group. You want your peer group to admire you. But when you hold your ideas or sanskaras and your own culture or when you speak about meditation to them, they simply use the word pakamat. They so the, what word? Pakamat. So, uh, what, uh, so this, this becomes sometimes gives you a feeling of uh, loneliness that people aren't really accepting you. They, uh, you're not getting your friends. Even if you try to be a little social, you yourself don't tend to accept their ideas because find it a little stupid sometimes. So, what guidance would you like to give to such a team? Thank Very you. good question. This is, see, I like honesty and real serious Sida question, you know, this is a very good question. How to uh, survive and have a social life and friends when there is peer pressure, peer pressure, uh, pre peer pressure to do all kinds of things uh, and if you don't, and that is considered cool and uh, that is a western influence uh, and if you don't do it, then you are considered outcast or nerd or, you know, boring or things like that. See, there's many things you can do. First is, I know people, young people, who through a system of meditation and a certain lifestyle have achieved such serious concentration, such ability to remember things, such calmness, such uh, composure that automatically others around them say, wow, this is, some, this, is an inter this is a different person. Isko shift, isko hilana itna easy nahi hai. Ye both reliable aadmi hai. Ye insaan bada character ka hai. Isko aap, uh, you know, you can't uh, fool around with this person. This is a solid person. Uh, and sometimes, such a person in the long run becomes actually more popular because others are considered traitors, betrayers, opportunists. They get you in trouble. So what happens is you have to, in your social profile, like in investments, you have to make a short term versus long term trade off. If you are, if you are making, if you are going for impulse, short term, immediate, kya abhi fayda hoga, then you have to join the gang, whatever they're doing. But if you think longer term and say ki aaj se kuch saal baad, I may be in much better state because I put my, I've developed my consciousness, I've developed my mind, I've developed my career, I'm a stronger person. And so, you know, a few years later, these guys may not be where I am and I'll be actually sought after. I'll be a, and you know, a person who's of good character, you will, if you are a young woman who is radiating good sattvic values, good character, you know, believe me, there'll be a lot more people interested in you than if you are just another loose person running around, which may seem like fun today, but when later on, maybe people will say, okay, that was a fun person to have, but not somebody I would want for the long term. So you see, you have to understand short term versus long term trade off. Because any human being, no matter how corrupted they are, deep inside they have a voice which longs for that purity. Even if they don't have it, they long for it in this other person. So if you are that other person, you are much more precious and sought after, yeah. Even whereas in a society where you are surrounded by the corrupt values, you become like them. Immediately you'll be popular for a while, but you're no different than anybody. You're just like one of many. Then instead of drinking two glasses, they're drinking five, so you are drinking six. And instead of going out till three o'clock, they're going out till four, so you are also going out till five. The point is that. You are in a rat race which never ends. And you see, then you just become part of this bed chal and this bandwagon. Whereas if you are sure and if you are rooted and you build your character and you build your career 
and you build your lifestyle, you will be far better than all these people a few years later. So when you are facing this kind of peer pressure, you must have the vichar, the strength. You must have, in your meditation, withdraw to a certain place and see, witness from that place what's going on inside you, outside you. And there is a certain meditation technique Raman Maharshi taught, vichar, which is, you know, who am I, what is going on, witnessing, it's just witnessing what's happening. When you practice that, you will realize that actually this kind of a temptation at first will come and look very exciting and very strong, but you let it pass, it will go through. You will be left with a certain calm and a certain composure, which will become the envy of all these people. They'll say, how is this person so stolid, such a reliable friend, the kind of person we want to confide in, the kind of person who we would like to have as a friend. So you can become more special, I would say. You can become more special if you stick to your values. Yeah? Whereas if you give in, you're just one more person like them. So I think it's basically the self-discipline of short term versus long term, which is a, which is a trade off that we all have to make. But I'm very glad you were conscious. See, the first breakthrough is what this young lady has already achieved. That is to become self-conscious that there is this thing going on. Huh? Most people are not even able to withdraw and witness and say, Are, bhai, well, this is going on, everybody is doing this, it sounds exciting, if I don't do it, they do this. So it, at least your analytical mind has started uh, spinning, you know, some question. That's very good. And you should cultivate friendships with people who will reinforce it. You should join a kind of a good satsang group of youth. There are many of them in every town. I know in Mumbai also. Uh, you should join where you know you go eat once a week and you get nourishment. And you should have a sadhana or some kind of a practice uh, every morning. And then it will help you not go with this uh, bandwagon. I think uh, uh, you should study what happens to such people like the common ones you're talking about later in life. They end up on addiction, they end up in crime, they end up in broken families, uh, they end up sacrificing quite a lot. And so all sorts of things have a karmic effect. At first it seems like good time and they are not mature enough to realize that there are consequences, they'll pay the price a few years later. So if you are the mature kind, then you should constantly read what is the problems of these modern societies, like how many people in the United States, a very, very large percent are on psychiatric drugs. Very large percent. How many are in prison? Some three, four million people in prison. How many people are on drug rehabilitation? You know? So, uh, if you look at how many, uh, you know, uh, teenage pregnancies, how many single moms, uh, and how many are sort of, uh, you know, on various drug needles and all that, it's a very, very large percentage. And that is a very materially advanced society still having these problems. So you can imitate the bad qualities of the West or you can imitate good qualities of the West. I think West has got some phenomenally good qualities. They have a lot of work ethic. Westerners have good work ethic. They will really work hard. I mean, you give them a job and they are uh, they accept it and they, they agree to the terms, they will work very hard to make it happen. They, they have uh, also good grounding to help thy neighbor, those kind of things. You know, every time I've been in trouble, I've asked a Westerner, I've gotten help. Indian may cop out and say, Are, I'm busy or I told this guy, didn't he call you, he's supposed to have called you, I made this arrangement, like that they'll say, to fizzle out of it. But you know, the Westerners have some extremely good qualities. Every culture has got some good qualities. So we don't have to pick up the bad qualities which those people are rejecting. Do you know that smoking is on the decline in the United States? You may not know this. Smoking is on the decline. Number of cigarettes uh, is gone now. And the cigarette companies are exporting to Asia as the biggest market. Asia is the biggest market. You see, when I was uh, 
in my corporate life, it was a normally done thing, Christmas party, you bring a bottle of liquor and a gift. And then towards the end of my corporate career, the trend had changed. A lot of people would say that they don't like it because it's not good for you. And uh, the trend changed to chocolates or something else, you know. So I think uh, India has picked up this uh, hedonistic, uh, very quick money, quick wealth, suddenly empowered youth, very arrogant and showing off. And that is a path to disaster also. Some of these people will get up, end up getting in serious trouble also. So it's good that you are reflecting and you don't want to lecture others and uh, then they'll come after you and say, oh, you are no good, you are not a boring person. You just sort of be uh, into your own self until you are very strong and then you can tell others. But first you have to be so strong that no matter that, that even if you go public and tell others this is my value system, no, nothing will shake you. First, you have to achieve that strength privately in yourself. Sir, I would like to thank you for a very enlightening lecture. And I have some couple of questions. The first one is uh, how you would assess Obama's visit to India and attracting IT young IT fraternity and generating jobs for them in US. So would you call it as a, uh, as term just you explained uh, digestion? Also, how you would assess that? That is one question. Shall I ask the other question later? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ask the other question. Uh, the other question is how would the synergy between materialism of today and the spiritualism of our tradition and culture can be attained? Because Very no doubt science and technology has given us enormous comforts. But at the same time, having a peaceful sleep is also equally important. Sure. And whether in the world of competition, whether we are able to get that. Good. Thank you, sir. Both are excellent questions. So I think trade is not digestion if we do it with strength. If we do it, if two people are exchanging, I, I am uh, giving something to her, she's giving something to me, but we are both equals, not uh, one is being taken advantage of, then that is not digestion. That is trade. So if uh, India is exporting IT uh, and we are importing something else, we are importing airplanes from them, you know, that is all trade. What bothers me is that these call center people are all faking an American identity. Uh, they've got names like John and Paul and Susie and all that. And they are also living in a make-believe, imagined world that they're living in Dallas and they are cheering the Dallas Cowboys, their, you know, uh, football team and all that. So this is kind of brainwashing them into a kind of delusion. So the youth that are uh, imagining that they are somebody they are not are probably getting uh, uprooted and confused. This is, this is a problem. Uh, I do not find the same uh, mixed up nature among Chinese. I find that they're quite uh, clear that they're Chinese, they're different, they're not ashamed of being different, they are assertive, and you will find Chinese asserting their Chinese-ness more and more. So this, I think, uh, uh, trade, trade is good, but not losing your identity and your bearings. So you can do it on your own terms, and you don't have to, uh, you know, get mixed up. The second question, which is, I think, a uh, very important one, uh, how to m uh, combine a good dharmic spiritual kind of life with uh, you know material well-being. Nowhere in our dharma does it say you neglect your body or you don't have enough money. You you do you, that sort of a thing is stereotyped. It's only for a sadhu who's a sannyasi and only a small percent of people ever in Indian history were sannyasis. And nowhere does it say that the goal is to make 100% sannyasis. Because if you have 100% sannyasis and not a balance of varnas, then you're not going to have a functioning society. So uh, the sannyasi dharma and the sannyasi ideal is only for certain people. And often since they are the teachers, they, they tend to teach as if everybody else is supposed to be like that. But people are not supposed to be like that. There's always been people who are traders, people who are political leaders, the kshatriyas, there have been all kinds of people. You look at the Mahabharat, you look in any and you look in the physical evidence of how much Indian monuments there are, how great the scientific technological thing is, like I was mentioning, and there is no doubt about it. Now today, the 
practice of what I call Adhyatma Vidya, the inner, which the, trans, the best translation I can give you is inner sciences, the science of the inside, inner being, is becoming extremely important in the West as a way to uh, enhance learning. Uh, accelerated learning techniques are being developed out of this. Uh, mind management, uh, you know, m harmony among people. Uh, prisoners who go through uh, this Adhyatma Vidya are given lighter sentences and some of them are let out easily because they're less violent. They can show that they're less violent. So uh, this inner science is good for uh, your performance in the outer world. Athletes are learning yoga and meditation. Musicians are learning. Uh, in, in IBM, they have a meditation room which was started by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's TM program. So anybody who is initiated or anybody at all who wants can go during working hours, sit quietly and meditate and come back. Uh, and there's no, nobody thinks there's anything wrong with it. So you find that um, uh, the West is taking on many of these Indian inner, inner journey techniques while Indians are still having doubt. My concern is that uh, West will appropriate and take over all this, call it their own, give it their spin, give it their twist, make a ton of money selling it back to Indians. <coughs> Indians will be happy I'm here to pay the vote of thanks. It is my proud and privilege to once thank again, Mr. Malhotra. So uh, I think uh, whether this generation uh, adopts the inner sciences of India or whether their kids adopt it by buying it back from America, that's the choice. But it will come back. I would rather that it come back as authentic from our own source. Because not only it's a question of protecting the continuity of our tradition, but also the quality is far substantial, far richer. Because when you have a fruit tree, and if you harvest the fruits, if you don't look after the roots, then the fruits will stop coming. But if you nurture the roots, you can keep harvesting year after year. So the tree of wisdom in our civilization, the roots must be preserved. And the roots are right here. And then we can keep getting all these things that the Westerners have got plus 100 more. So that is why I want the young people to understand. You should, you should have a serious uh, examination of India's traditions of the inner journey and set aside, you know, 20 minutes a day or some practice, 20 minutes a day. And you will find within three months your performance in college will improve. Your ability to have friends will improve. You'll be more relaxed. You'll be less uh, anxious. You'll be less worried. Your memory will go up. These, these techniques are being taught in education now. So I think uh, it's actually very synergistic. You say that uh, the certain mantras, they have power and they, they should not be translated not only because they have a specific meaning, but a particular technique, the vibrations they create, that's why they should not be translated as such. So about that you have told about the, uh, uh, some story about you from Brahadaranya Upanishad about the, 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 the message which was given by Prajapati to gods, to demons and to human beings was only one letter, the. So it had different meanings. For gods, it was the you control yourselves because they were enjoying power. For asuras, daya, have compassion. And for human beings, dana, charity. So on this point of non-translatables, if you tell something to our young generation, yeah. it will be useful for them. See, every civilization has its own unique experience. Not that one is superior to the other, but they are different. Uh, a, a civilization that emerged in the desert does not have the same uh, understanding as a civilization that emerged in the forest. Uh, and the forest does not have the same experience as a desert. Uh, the civilization that emerged in the Eskimos in, uh, in, in the ice places, snow and ice, is different. Uh, you know, a civilization that's in a tropical island is different. So we have different geographies, different histories, different influences on us. 
And so civilizations have different experiences. It's nothing to do with being superior or inferior. Now, the words that emerge out of a certain civilization reflect the experience. And so you can't translate uh, certain words into another culture's language who never had that experience. So yog never existed, it has not been developed, so they don't have a word for it. It's fine, we should just use yog. Don't call it exercise, don't call it gymnastics, don't call it prayer, it's none of those. It's not, that those are all useless translations. Just be happy with yog. Shakti is not, uh, you know, energy, because shakti is also divine. It's not just a material thing like energy. So I think the idea of uh, uh, non-translatable means that even if you are speaking in English, so back to the gentleman's question to the translation in other languages, and I agreed we should be translating this pustak in other languages, but even when you are speaking in English, there are about 50 words, 75 words of Sanskrit you should each learn. So part of the training should be that even if you are not in the Sanskrit department learning Sanskrit, Take 50 important words which are commonly mistranslated, which are commonly you, uh, replaced with English and they don't mean the same thing. Words that are not very esoteric and very uh, too sophisticated but which can be useful. And ask the person to take 10 words, then take another 10 words and make it part of his English vocabulary. So even if you're talking in English, you can just say Shakti, and you can say Yoga. And you don't have to, you can say Dharma, it's not the same as religion. Uh, you can you can start using a few of these words and you know when you use them you will force yourself to learn more about them because when you're using them you want to explain then somebody will question well why does it uh, what is different then you go back and research what is different next time you'll say it with more confidence so just by using a word over a period of years you will become better and better at understanding how it's different and being able to explain it to other people not with anger, not with superiority, not knocking them down, but just saying this is different. You know, this is our tradition, this is what the word is, and there is no other word I can use, so I will use my word. This, is a, this can open up a whole journey for the young generation. If you put 50 Sanskrit words that are non-translatables, that are very strategically selected, then you can speak in English, you can go and do IT, you can become whatever materialist thing, but if those words are part of your thinking, those vibrations are part of you, that is a seed inside you which will blossom. And as you get older, you will realize more and more. Those 50 words will attract hundreds of other words. So that's uh, what I suggest uh, you should do. You made a passing reference to uh, studying of consciousness. And uh, I just wanted to know, a few years back I had a, heard a lecture from a famous uh, physicist in India, Dr. Shrikant, who is uh, now uh, doing a lot of research on consciousness and quantum physics, the relation between two in Bangalore. Uh, would you just throw a little more light on this uh, consciousness and study of consciousness? Yeah. Uh, in the 1990s, I started attending these consciousness conferences in Tucson, Arizona, which are held every two years. And I was surprised to find how much of Indian ideas of consciousness they had appropriated. You know, the, the idea of uh, unity consciousness they had appropriated into physics. Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger, the two who got the Nobel Prize in quantum physics, were quoting Vedanta and Vedas and as their source of inspiration. But by the 90s, all that had been forgotten and uh, some Westerners had taken over that whole movement and completely forgotten the Indian sources. So this was one of my first projects when I started the foundation is to revive interest among Indian thinkers on the study of consciousness in India. And uh, I think you're talking about the Vivekananda Institute in near Bangalore where they're doing research. Chikant, he's with the... Okay, he's retired from here. There's also a, an institute near uh, Bangalore. I've been encouraging them to do the research which the Westerners are doing. Rather than the Westerners doing research on yogis, we can do it ourselves and publish the papers ourselves. And I've also encouraged and funded a lot of uh, young scholars like, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned Sangeeta Menon at, and really encouraged them to talk about Indian models of consciousness and how they go with modern quantum physics. 
Now this uh, quantum physics and consciousness is therefore become a trend. We had a lot to do with starting that trend about 15 years ago. It's become a trend and a lot of Indian scientists have started picking up this. Where it needs to go next is in the life sciences. Physics, physics is not life sciences. So physics gives you the role of consciousness in quantum mechanics, but I'm more interested in biology. There is a role of pran and consciousness in biology. I think that is the, uh, the cutting edge of science, I would think has a lot of potential, because there the application can also be leading to new medical breakthroughs and healing systems. And I think people who are doing research on cognitive science and neuroscience are building model, are using the ideas of uh, Indian thought in a way that can have very practical applications also. Now, the consciousness studies, Vedanta consciousness studies and quantum physics uh, gives us uh, a compatibility between the two. It tells us that uh, uh, the classical Indian thought is very compatible with modern quantum physics. It tells us that. But we need to go beyond past, com uh, saying, okay, we had something in the past which is compatible with something the Westerners came up with, to future and make some predictions, make some new theories, make some breakthroughs using our tradition. That will become very important. So that is where I'm interested. I think they have already crossed some barrier and they are putting that as biophysics in the, uh, you know, uh, Institute of Cancer Research at uh, Parel, yeah, mm -hmm. Tata Memorial. And uh, I think this uh, consciousness, the study of consciousness and biophysics, somewhere they are going into a breakthrough for healing yes. and such. Uh, yes. That not much has been uh, exposed or made public about it. Yeah. So I just See, the whole idea of uh, my intention, uh, which is my intention as a meditator, uh, in a state of consciousness where it's not cluttered with old sanskars, it's not cluttered with ego, it's a very pure state. And in that state, a certain intention and how it bears fruit uh, is a, a principle that needs to be quantified and studied in the laboratory. And also the role of negative thinking that can generate cancers and that can generate all kinds of problems. Because in quantum mechanics, uh, the, quant the quantum uncertainty gets collapsed into one of several possibilities. There are many possibilities, and uh, that is the uncertainty principle. And it gets collapsed into one of them based on some correlations. And this business of constantly harping on negatives, generating negative results, uh, is sort of a philosophical, there is a philosophical argument like that. But from a philosophical argument to scientific argument, you need laboratory proof. And so our people, uh, I'm glad to know from you that our people are taking this up because I've been wanting them to take it up. Until 10 years ago, uh, in the 90s, West was doing the laboratory studies and publishing the papers and calling it original. But the subjects who were being studied were Indian or Tibetan because the Westerners did not have that ability to do that. So I was always arguing that the scientist is not the one with the stopwatch who's measuring what you've done. The scientist is the one with the, who's able to actually achieve this. The inner scientist is the one who's uh, got the adhyatma with there to achieve a state of consciousness. The outer scientist got the measurement device and he can measure that what you're saying is happening, you know. So we need to combine the inner science and the outer science in India, publish these papers, get the breakthrough uh, uh, and, and it can have a huge potential. Thank you. The author of Make Different for accepting our invitation. Thank you, sir, for introducing certain terms like southernization, visa effect or U-turn, redevelopment of India, and for raising the fundamental questions regarding the essence of Indian civilization. Your concern for preserving the tradition or heritage is noted by the teachers as well as by the students. Actually, my students have asked me to convey their gratitude to the organizers. So on their behalf, I thank profusely to the organizers, organizers for providing the opportunity to know these ideas at such young age. 
I also thank the technical staff handling the recording, photography and sound system. Again, the organizers KJ Somaya Bharatiya Sanskriti Peetham, KJ Somaya College of Arts and Commerce and SK Somaya of Arts, Science and Commerce need to be thanked. Last but not the least, the audience is also to be thanked for raising pertinent questions and enriching the discussion. Thank you once again to one and all. Thank you.